in case you need a reminder, there are cushions and blankets. We're in the fog zone, so that might be nice for tonight. And this evening, um, yeah, we're going to do, I, I'm enjoying doing a kind of series of different kinds of practices that are still relating back to the teaching on uh, the fingers pointing at the moon. So for those who weren't here, the fingers pointing at the moon. Uh oh, I think we have to say that we are cool with recording. Welcome friends online. Um, so the fingers pointing at the moon, which is a couple chapters back, just this beautiful practice that recognizes often all of the methods and all the metaphors and all the stories can sometimes get in the way of the direct experience of our practice and the direct experience, especially of a sense of primordial awareness, this kind of essence or ground of being. So a lot of our practices kind of um, in some ways help us take next steps towards that experience. And I think that's enormously beneficial. And we did uh, last week, the handshake with emotion practice that kind of meets the current material uh, that's with us maybe in the last week. So we brought to mind something kind of stressful or difficult and then dropped into the body and worked with that immediately. And this week in a kind of continuation of how can we get ourselves closer to that direct experience? We're going to start with a Tonglen practice. I realize I uh, haven't taught that here in a while. We, um, many of us practiced it together a lot during the pandemic. I think it was like Tonglen, 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 at least for the first 18 months. Um, it's a really interesting practice. Uh, it has its origins in Tibetan Buddhism, and I'll talk a little bit about it and give you some. Yeah, I hope a richer understanding of that practice. And then we will, of course, get into the story of the Buddha. But one of the reasons I was thinking about Tonglen for tonight is the, the theme um, of tonight, or one of the big stories that happens tonight, total spoiler alert, um, is that we actually are with the Buddha as he travels back to be with his dad as his dad dies. And that's really like I've read it now like a couple times in preparation for tonight and it's so tender, you know, it's so sweet and so difficult. Um, the Buddha makes it sound really easy, right? His experience of being with his dad. And some of you may remember a couple chapters back, it was the first time the Buddha came home after his awakening. So he'd been gone for seven years and he came home and everyone is rejoicing and seeing him and his dad, you know, uses the opportunity to be like, you don't write, you don't call, you're leaving so soon, you know, like giving him the kind of classic guilt trip, which is, uh, it's so human. Uh, and Buddha's like, Hmm, sounds like attachment. That's a great place to work. And just this, I think, hilarity of trying to be bring awakening to our everyday life, you know, like it's, it's extremely challenging. And so we fast forward, it's about three or four years um, since that first visit home where we, we kind of reunite with the king uh, and, and Buddha comes to this very last phase and stage. And as I was reading this practice, it just really reminded me of how powerful Tonglen practice is. That was something I was doing a great deal of when my mom was towards the end. Um, so definitely the last acute six months of her illness, but in the years before she passed, it was such a sense of um, efficacy. Like there was something I could do. It wasn't just witnessing the suffering of someone I love and wishing it to be different or trying to fix it or trying to avoid it. There was something I could do. And when I was looking up the origins of Tonglen, um, many of you know it comes from these Lojong slogans, which we did a couple of years ago. These 50 slogans that are intended to help transform our mind. So one of those slogans is around um, taking and um, and receiving and giving, taking and receiving. It's just this way of imagining yourself in the place of another. And I guess the historical origins, I only found one citation on this. So I, I would really like to look further was that actually in 11th century Tibet, there was a huge leprosy um, epidemic, you could say. 
and a need for a practice that one could do for others from a distance. And I, I thought that was interesting. So you will hear contemporary teachers whose origins are not in Tibetan Buddhism use Tonglen practice. Um, I imagine many folks in the room have heard of it, whether, it, uh, for example, very well-known teacher Sharon Salzberg, who's coming not out of a Tibetan Buddhist tradition, but offers Tonglen because so there's some good intermixing there. But coming out of the Tibetan tradition, Tonglen has this you know, kind of step-by-step -step process. And we'll go through these steps together. I'll describe them and then we'll practice them together. Uh, so the first step of Tonglen is what's called uh, flashing on absolute bodhicitta. Sometimes when we gather together and practice, we arouse the motivation of bodhicitta, of an awakened heart. It's a reminder of why we are here doing this practice. We are doing this individually in a group, but we're doing it individually actually for the sake of all other beings. That's our relative level, level bodhicitta, but actually the absolute bodhicitta is a recognition of our own awakening right here and now. I was like, that's the first step of Tonglen. That's, you know, like, let's ease in, like, boom. Uh, the idea is that we have a sense or some understanding that everything is temporary. There's an empty nature to all things. And it's, it is interesting, like before we decide to take on the suffering of others, right? Tonglen is taking on willingly the suffering of others, starting with a reminder that everything is temporary even the suffering of someone we love so much, like our own mother or family member, beloved, like that too is temporary. So we're supposed to start the practice with that kind of reminder. Um, the next phase of the practice, and there's so many different ways that it is taught in so many different ways, even I've been instructed and instructed this, but I, I like Pema Chodron's most simple teachings on it. Um, Pema Chodron, some may know, is a, a Western woman who was a Tibetan nun for many years. And her primary teacher was Chogyam Trungpa, who is coming out of this Shambhala school. And it's like, if you um, look up Tonglen, it'll be what you find a lot of is Pema Chodron. She's taught it for many, many years. And the first phase that she teaches after that flashing on bodhicitta is to do the visualization of Tonglen, but without a subject or object. So the main purpose of Tonglen, again, bringing someone or something or some event to mind and doing this exchange with it. But before you even bring that subject or object to mind, the first part is just visualizing the process of taking in what can feel dense or hard and extending out what feels spacious, open, warm. So we just have that as a kind of embodied experience. I find this really natural. Most of us do this a lot every day. This kind of natural on the spot Tonglen. Like we witness something difficult and we're like, ah. right? So it's that breath by breath, like getting ourselves in, in this pattern and familiarity that we can feel the tension or tightness. She calls it claustrophobia. I'm like, no, I don't, I'm not going to use that word, but you know, this tightness or feeling of being held in and then relaxing, releasing breath by breath. And then we choose a subject and it is actually quite traditional to choose, um, one's mother um, with the recognition that, you know, that can be a really complex relationship for a lot of us, uh, maybe all of us um, to different degrees. And what's interesting is, especially in the way Tema Chodron teaches it, she says, that even if you bring to mind your mom and, and her suffering, and it brings up feelings, frustration, anger, guilt, sadness, fear, you can then immediately do Tonglen for those feelings and then go back to your mom and then come back to the feelings. I am definitely not going to enforce anyone choose their mom. That's, um, I think, a personal choice, but someone who you care about. And it doesn't have to be someone who's entirely uncomplicated. If there's someone you care about and it's uncomplicated, it must be your pet. <laughs> so, you know, like that's that's really going to. Um, you know, have some level of complexity, but I'd say go, yeah. Yep. 
absolutely not. Absolutely not. And yeah, I've, I've been practicing for my mom since, you know, because of course, when, when someone we love is gone, we still think of them all the time. Right. And when we think of them, it's not like, oh yeah, that person, there's emotions, you know, there's memories, there's feelings, there's um, what you would call in the therapeutic modalities, unresolved content. Right. And I like to think of that more as, you know, wow, we still get a chance to work with this. And depending on um, where you are in your kind of cosmology and philosophy, there is a sense that, that I have started to really, really feel in my own um, life that these really close relationships, like our family and close people to us, these are probably not only this lifetime, right? And so I think of my mom and some of our difficulties and struggles I don't think it was only this lifetime. And my hope is that we worked through some of it so that in our next lifetime, there isn't quite so much, right? That we had. And so I think of it as I still have a chance to work through that in myself, even in a, in a, if you want to keep it on a more kind of uh, materialist level, right? If we have these relationships and their complexities and difficulties and someone passes, they're gone. We're like, oh, I'm done. You know, like don't have to deal with that. It still lives in us. Right. And it lives in especially what's called our internal working model of the world. And these primary core relationships influence how we relate to others. I know we all know that attachment theory has become happily very popular, right? Early core relationships matter. They don't disappear as we grow older. So we can even think of doing these, this Tonglen practice for people who are gone as a way to continue working that material, purifying that material. So yeah, I, I think it's a really amazing practice to do with folks who, who aren't with us. So thank you. So we do the, the visualization, flashing a bodhicitta, visualization of just that contraction and then extension or release. Um, and then we choose someone and we bring to mind, you know, their difficulties and we really imagine like releasing some of their burden by taking it ourselves. This can feel like very counterintuitive, borderline toxic uh, for folks. If this is like a new practice, you're like, I'm going to do what? I'm going to invite into my heart or into my space someone else's difficulties. Um, but the practice is intended to actually really have a sense of transformation and, and not be something we pull in and we hold there. We pull it in and then we release it literally through every pore of our body. We release it. So we're not taking it in and it like lives in us and gets heavy. Sometimes I won't do this tonight. Sometimes we use a visualization of smoke, cloud of smoke that gets especially sticky for people. You're like, okay, I'm breathing in smoke. That's, huh. Um, so we'll do it a bit more abstract tonight. We have, um, and then the, um, the fourth step or the third point five step of the practice. So again, we bring in, let's say our mother or someone else and they're suffering or struggling. Um, and then we extend out our sphere of care and concern to everybody who is, is like our mom, who struggled in that same way, right? So whether it's chronic pain or addiction, insecurity, um, we think of how many other people struggled that way and we do the practice for them. And we get to experience, this is truly, I think, uh, my favorite paradox, which is opening our heart to more and more people paradoxically makes our heart feel more open. Whereas like trying to hold out the suffering of all the people and all the beings makes our heart feel more closed. So strange. And yet I think there's a sense of not being alone. And also we get to release that armor and shielding that takes up so much energy of trying to keep safe. I'm going to keep this little safe place. But if we're trying to keep this safe place, like we're vigilant and we're like looking around and right. And then just the, okay, like I'm going to let this in and I'm going to extend out. Um, 
still not easy. I'm not saying this is an easy uh, thing to do, but the alternatives suck, right? They really do. Like holding your heart tight, trying to reject the suffering of other people. Has that ever worked for anybody? You know, or trying to like, in some ways, protect ourselves and just the people we love. That actually doesn't work either. Like the weight and the worries of the world, they're with us, maybe more than ever. So I I really think this is one of the only sane ways for us to face not only our own suffering, but the suffering of the world. And this is, you know, one of the main practices of being a compassion warrior, like a bodhisattva. So I think it's a really beautiful practice. Um, yeah. Any other questions before we do it? Have some folks in this room not done Tonglen? Don't feel embarrassed. It's totally OK. Fantastic. OK. So, yeah. Any, any other questions? I mean, obviously, experientially, it will be a thing um, that we'll do together. But questions about the practice? For folks who are, you know, Tonglen heads, shall we say, who've practiced this, anything you want to offer, um, you know, this is my word and my phrasing, but for those of us who are new in the room, like, what about Tonglen do you think is important to share? What have you noticed in your own practice? Mace. Yeah, I can repeat, but coming up would be very cool. Not at the desk. Um, just the the flash on emptiness is like a little abstract for me. So I just like to think that I have Buddha nature in my heart, and then it's not a problem to like. That I, that's why you do the flash, totally. Right? Yeah. So that like you don't feel that you're because my heart, Mesa's heart, is not prepared to take in the suffering of the world, but the heart that my heart is surrounded by is able to. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. No, ma'am. Yes. You got Thank it. you. So um, I have noticed that, especially doing it with people who I'm angry with after breakups, um, it changed the default way that I think about them in my mind. So whenever mm -hmm. the thought comes up of that person, instead of anger and you know hatred, it's how can I help or. Mm. I wish, you know, it changes how they feel changes. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, that's so powerful, right? Just being able to change, you know, not only in the moment, right? Like, that's great to have a momentary relief from this feeling of another suffering, but to actually have something that can shift our paradigm, um, how we experience something. Beautiful. Anyone else? Any other Thoughts, considerations? Yeah, Cage, please. Uh, for me, this has been a, a real big heart opener. So I, I found what's true, what Mace and Faza said, but also at the end when you're resting in awareness that that is really much easily accessed through the heart yes. the end, than in other practices. Perfect. I was just about to mention that, which is that, you know, Doing this, this kind of, I, I would say, like, it's almost like developing the musculature of our heart. Um, we're doing it, of course, because it's a wonderful practice. And so that we can connect to that, what is the finger pointing at the moon, that sense of spacious awareness at the end, right? Which Cage is describing that you're actually able to kind of drop into yourself once you do this practice that largely brings us into the body, right? And helps us connect the body and the breath with the mind. That's always going to be a good pathway into finding a sense of spaciousness and openness. Oh. Yes. It reminds me of what we say about breath work. Mm -hmm. You're doing it anyways. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, you know, because if you have listened to the news or walk down the street, you're already doing it. That's so right. you might as well do it with some intention That's... and metabolize it. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, there's no, um, no holding out. There's no way to completely avoid and 
deny and hermetically seal ourselves from the suffering. So, and it's so special to be able to do it, you know, together um, in community too, to have that support because you will um, maybe recognize and I'll kind of cue us to consider this at some point, each one of us is doing this work, you know, and that also, that brings that common humanity feel like, oh, this is just part of what we need to do to continue working on our heart opening and attention training and, um, and practice. So great. Now oh, it feels really special to do this here again, after quite a long break. Um, I spoke, I was extended even for me preamble. So if you want to stand up and stretch, do anything before we sit. Walt, were there any questions in the chat? Uh, no, none in the okay. chat and no hands okay. up. Okay. Okay. Well, I remember doing a lot of tongue glen with you in the pandemic. Oh yeah. <laughs> So let's give ourselves a couple of moments to connect with a posture that really invites our practice. So connecting with a posture that feels like we're inhabiting the dignity of our practice. So for many of us, we've already had a full day. And so this shift into the posture of meditation can be a shift away from what has already occurred today and a deliberate intentional shift towards this inner work so feeling and finding a sense of uprightness in the spine And feeling and finding a sense of gentleness and softness through the face and the chest and the belly. And checking in that your head feels as though it's resting evenly on top of your neck. And throughout the practice, you can check in and make sure your chin isn't sloping too far forward or your head isn't leaning too far back. And finding a place for your hands that feels stable. This could be palms down on the thighs or folded in the lap. Really feeling the support of the ground beneath you, whether sitting or through your feet. Remembering that while we remain upright out of our own volition, we also are supported in our uprightness and feel that support coming from beneath. And inviting our attention and awareness to drop into the body, to pour into the body, as though filling a vase with water. We fill our body entirely with our awareness and attention.
And of course, the mind will be busy and thoughts will arise, even immediately. Just to invite a sense of relaxation when you notice your mind has wandered and releasing the thoughts, coming back to settling into the sense of being in the body, connecting to the tactile sensations throughout the body. Letting our attention be curious and bright. Noticing the different areas of sensations. Maybe we notice a releasing of tension in the face or a softening, especially through the eyes or chest. As we notice the body, we notice this wonderful, simple fluctuation of breath. The breath breathing the body. Allow some of our attention and awareness to follow this beautiful undulation, this coming and going. With the possibility that each breath might be a little bit different. And we can bring that bright curiosity to the next breath as though it were the very first breath we'd ever known. It really doesn't matter how many times we get distracted. And just what to focus on is how we return. How generous can we be with ourselves for falling away? How much relaxation can we invite as we make our way back to focusing on the breath and the body? With this focus on the body and the breath, maybe feel or imagine a sense of stillness. Of course, there's some subtle movement, but the stillness of inviting our attention, awareness to be right here. 
and physically having our body here, not going anywhere else, right here, feeling the stillness of being fully here. And it's like the pond when it settles after a rock has been thrown in it. And all those ripples just gently come back to stillness. A natural state. With <clears throat> this stillness, you can turn into a sense of openness and spaciousness. And we can feel this spaciousness and openness, not only throughout the body, but also as a sense of porousness between our body and the space around us. Taking a moment to first motivate this sense of relative bodhicitta. Remembering that our practice here connects us to the work and service and support we can be for the world. Whether or not you feel that is part of your everyday or maybe that feels remote in this moment. Just remembering and recollecting the naturalness of feeling a sense of connection, responsibility, and care for other beings. And this can be a sense of buoyancy in the heart. As we move into this absolute bodhicitta, this sense of our awake nature, which is already here. We can have a sense of 
such a vast and great capacity for love, care, connection. Even if today we might feel tired or depleted, remembering that there's a, a deep storehouse within us, all the love we have received in this lifetime, all the love we have extended in this lifetime. And this possibility, this spark of our own Buddha nature. So a couple moments to rest our mind in this outrageous and yet wonderful possibility that we have vast capacity for care. Resting in the knowing that even the difficulties that feel the most acute, they shift and change. Even the situations that feel the most personal are directed towards us. So much complexity. So much unknowable. then we shift to this visualization, just this sense of breathing in and feeling that tightness or that heaviness, what could feel difficult. And then breathing out and feeling a sense of expansion and openness. And getting ourselves acquainted with this rhythm of breath. Just breathing in, maybe feeling some tension or tightness, heaviness, an uncomfortable kind of warmth. And then breathing out, feeling relief, release, openness. A couple more breaths here, really getting a feel for this balance. And as much as possible, trying to have the breaths be even. So even if we're breathing in a bit longer, no problem. But then breathing out a bit longer.
now we shift and invite ourselves to bring someone to mind, someone we care for. It could be a mother, a brother, a sister, a lover, a friend, a child, a colleague. Bring this person really vividly to mind. Imagining their presence and beingness. Imagining their struggles. You may notice quite quickly that already bringing to mind this person and their struggles, there may be an initial sense of that contraction or heaviness. Tuning into the heart's aspiration here. When it is the suffering of someone we care for, the heart naturally feels a desire to alleviate that suffering. Maybe there's a particular moment or time in which you can really recall that sense of this being and their struggles. For just a couple more moments before we bring the breath back, just allowing this memory to tenderize and open the heart. Really prime the pump for this sense of caring and compassion by making the suffering of this other feel so real. Bringing back the breath with the inhale, we imagine taking in some of the heaviness and difficulty of this being. And with our exhale, releasing, transforming, purifying. Inhale, bringing to mind the difficulty and struggle of this being and inviting it into our own. Holding that burden and then transforming it with our exhale to a sense of spaciousness, openness. Maybe there's something particular to this person who you know. Maybe they'd love if you sent them a hug or some sunlight. Maybe what they'd really love is a cup of tea or to have their hand held. You can feel the quality of that through the exhale. If you feel a sense of distress, and really notice your own concern for this being who suffers, then offer yourself the practice. Focusing on the inhale, those feelings of distress and tightness in yourself. And on the exhale, extending that compassionate wish. Purifying. Releasing. Let's continue now as much as possible holding ourselves with this beloved or our own beloved self and our focus of attention, breath by breath. Continuing this practice with a real sense of 
this as a training ground, a gymnasium of compassion and care, the strength of inviting in another's difficulty and the power of transforming it and extending it. A couple more breaths here. Checking in in the body, noticing if anywhere feels stuck or tight. Allowing our breath to help permeate and ventilate these areas. Very gently allowing this being, this beloved being, to recede into the background. And feeling the goodness of having transformed some of their challenges and difficulties. Opened our heart to them fully. And then imagine just widening the heart even more. through the consideration of other beings who struggle just like this beloved being. Imagining how many other countless folks out there may be experiencing that same kind of difficulty. And again, using the breath to help with this tender aspiration, this feeling of compassion for such a wide sphere of beings. We could almost imagine these beings in front of us in a vast semicircle. We may not know their faces or their names, but we know enough. Their desire to be free from suffering the difficulty of their suffering. With our next inhale, we imagine taking on some of this burden in order to transform it at our heart. Inhale, drawing in the tightness, the heaviness, and exhale, releasing Spacious, open, clear. Feel the body, the heart, the awareness wide open, drawing in and extending out. Again, at any time, we can practice for ourselves. If the feelings start to feel strong or overwhelming, it could be that we also struggle with the same difficulty. And this practice is also for us. Mm-hmm. 
doing our three last breaths of this practice together. Inhaling, drawing in, feeling the courageousness. Exhale, extending out, opening the heart, releasing, transformed. Inhale, drawing in, feeling that tension and tightness, and exhale, releasing. One last time together, inhale, drawing in, and a really big exhale, release. And rest in that release, rest in the spaciousness and openness of not holding. Finding once again the uprightness of the spine and the softness of the front of the body. And connecting to what other level of openness or spaciousness is here. Feel or imagine the possibility of more space and room for whatever is here. A sense of fluidity with thoughts or sensations, all phenomena. Maybe the possibility of being the awareness, not observing the awareness.
while maintaining whatever spaciousness is here, returning and re-inhabiting the body, gathering our attention through the next breath. And bringing our practice to its close with three long breaths together. Gently beginning and inhale slowly. And exhale slowly. Once more, inhaling slowly. Exhaling slowly. One last one together. Inhaling slowly. And exhaling. Thank you for your practice. Very palpable uh, presence in this room. And I hope you can feel that online too. Just a real sense of really being, yeah, in this practice together. So thank you. Thoughts? Questions, reflections on that practice? Excuse me, before I do that, just a reminder. (laughs) It's so important for us here at the Dharma Collective to be in accordance with our values, those deepest values of compassion. So when we are speaking, when we are listening, really doing so with compassion and as much as possible, minimal, if not no judgment. Uh, both for what's being said and even of yourself, of what you say. It's really important for us to try to create that supportive opportunity for Sangha through our communication with one another. Everybody floating in spacious awareness. <laughs> yeah, I found that practice extremely tender, very beautiful to to bring. Uh, I haven't I haven't practiced for my mom in a while. I appreciated that that opportunity to kind of uh, reconnect and feel that. And uh, it was a uh, interesting for me. <clears throat> I did have this sense that her own, her difficulty that I was imagining, um, some of her pain and struggles, they're also my pain and struggles. So it was like some really good compassion for her and for me at the same time. That was very powerful. Um, And I did, it felt very grateful to have, it was easier to access that sense of spaciousness at the end. Having kind of, as Cage said, going through the door of the heart to open up into that spaciousness. Any other questions? No pressure, but would especially love to hear from the noobs. Yes, please. Do you mind? Can we grab that mic to you? We can bring it to you. Thank you, Sarana. So, just a comment. Um, yeah, I definitely felt like I was floating somewhere else. But um, for me, I, w- I started the practice for my mom also because we I just recently lost her mm. uh, to two years now, but still recent in my yeah. life. <laughs> um, but then my brother kept coming into it. And so I switched from my mom towards my brother, who's 
struggling even more so than all of us yeah. with her passing mm. and so it was just i thought it was very, very interesting like i my intention was you know to start yeah. practice with my mom and as soon as i closed my eyes like my brother came knocking yep. down like yo get out of here you know but so yeah it was really interesting that yeah. happened beautiful yeah yeah and i i think that's um it's nice to leave that openness you know of we think we know who we're going to practice for but it might be something or someone else that shows up for us. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts or reflections? I don't see any hands online, but please feel free, Walt, to let me know if I don't see it. I think my eyesight's getting worse. I'm in that like denial phase where I'm like, we're good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I see the knowing chuckles. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts or reflections on that practice? Thank you. I was also practicing with, for my mom with my mom and felt my own struggles within that for sure. And, um, Uh, while she was with me, I was kind of inviting her into, for, for both of us to be breathing out and mm. doing it together. Yeah. So breathing out the, the suffering, her suffering, my suffering. But it was a kind of um, collective endeavor, mm. which felt really nice because it was not kind of me imposing my, hey, I'm going to deal with your suffering. But it was like, let's do it together. Beautiful. Yeah. And it was, and mm. like, we kind of when it when I was expanding it out, it was the same thing. Like, I'm not, it's not me that's going to alleviate it, but let's have do this thing together. Mm. It really felt really good. Thank you for sharing that. I love that. Um, yeah, and again, it's so interesting how much creativity there can be in this practice, right? There's a structure, but the breathing together. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. Oh, great. I see a hand or I didn't really, but someone showed me there was a hand. <laughs> I can't see the name though. Would you mind? Oh, yeah. oh yes, please. Hi. Hi. Um, so I wanted to say thank you for um, bringing in this idea of, of switching to yourself. I find the practice itself very challenging to begin with. Um, and then um, I brought in someone close to me who's battling a substance abuse issue that's really hard and really hard for me. So I was trying, I was, you know, trying to do the practice for her. Yeah. And when it got to be too much, I just went to the practice for me and that allowed me to be able to do the practice um, mm. and it was so helpful. So thank you so much. Mm. That's the first time that was sort of offered as an invitation. So um, for mm. me anyways, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I, cl I completely agree. And I think I've spent far too much time efforting my way through compassion practices before. Like, I really want to feel compassion for this person. Um, and it can, it can get really brittle, you know, if, if we don't bring in some of that care for ourselves, if we can, you know, like, yeah, this is, um, and you know, again, there's so many ways to teach Tonglen, but one way we did a lot during the pandemic was really starting with ourselves every time as like a cleaning of the own heart, you know, before inviting someone to sit by the fire with you. Um, but I think the oscillation back and forth between ourself and this other being, um, yeah, really beautiful. The bodhicitta is very helpful as well, but I've just cultivated so much tenderness and so much openness that now I find the Tonglen practice a little challenging, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such a funny thing, isn't it, right? We practice more and we realize we're 
completely insane. Uh, well, we, we were before but we like realize it more. And then we also become like more empathically distressed, right? Because we are more aware of others. And so just as we are, you know, doing the work or needing more support in order to be in it, um, to be present is actually, um, yeah, it's a bit uncomfortable. Denial and distraction is like, it doesn't work, but it's pretty great, you know, like to keep pushing and pushing stuff away and just, I don't know. Um, being present with it does, takes work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any other thoughts, questions, reflections on the practice? Please. Yes. This is a new practice for me, and I have a sort of recurring question since I've only come to this class a few times, which is sort of how to think about and almost make sense of a new practice, because mm -hmm. this was not that was not a sort of easy practice for me. And so I find myself jumping into judgment mode about like, OK, this isn't a good form for me. I need to go back to my other yeah. type of practice. But that feels like that's maybe not the ideal way to think about it. And so the bigger question I'm working with is how do I sort of choose or uh, assess a practice? Yeah. Because it feels wrong to say like, all right, I was joking. We were joking with Ricky last time. Like, all right, that was a 10 out of 10 practice. That's great. Yeah. That feels like not the right, right. approach, but also saying that it doesn't matter what I do. It makes no difference. Yeah. I don't even need to meditate is also. Right. Not yep. the not the right way. <laughs> no, that's a great question. Can I ask if you don't mind, like what was hard or what felt difficult about it? Um, I think well, what's telling partly for me is just the unfamiliarity of it. Yeah. So I do have other practices where it's familiar and there's, I don't know, I mean a, a sort of ritual where I it's easier for me to sort of go to a more mindful place. And so maybe that part of it is just kind of a learning curve. Um, yeah. And mindful being like present, like here, as opposed to distracted or. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, in general, I mean, I love this question. I think in general with practices, especially new practices for folks, because of, you know, going to classes, you kind of have to you don't really have to, but you know, it's easier to go with what's being offered. But I think in our daily life, we really treat the practices like our own little apothecary and like use what's good for us on a certain day. But when you're getting to know practices, I really do recommend getting familiar with one. Mm -hmm. um, so spending a couple weeks with one, you know, so a recording are so many great Tonglen recordings um, online. Um, we have a, a SoundCloud um, Cultivating Emotional Balance is a course I've taught for many years and we have a SoundCloud and there's a number of tongue blends on there totally free. Mm -hmm. So to just choose it and be like, I'm just going to work with this for a while mm -hmm. um, and then be able to evaluate like, yeah, this would be good in this circumstance, but not in this. Right. Like this is good. You know, um, when I'm really, you know, struggling in this way, but actually like, yeah, I don't know. I think it can be really helpful to just try the, a single practice for a while. And, you know, you were saying there's other practices for you right now that, um, that are familiar and that's great. And I think one of the things I really appreciate from how, um, how I was taught and I try to offer here is we're always going to settle in the same way, you know, body, speech, mind settling into their natural states, stillness, openness, um, and, uh, and silence. And then we're going to sometimes do more of a, what would be called focused attention, um, visualization. And then again, this like into the openness, into the spaciousness. So that's the, that's the, the hidden, uh, curriculum behind it all mm. and i think familiarizing with the format is so helpful like you know what to expect so yeah so i'm hearing you say give it time but then there is a time to sort of evaluate and say is this right for me or not yeah definitely yeah um and i think you know i think it is interesting to think like are there any practices I'm trying to think is there any practices i really don't like and i never do um 
I don't think so. Mm-hmm. And I do find a real benefit for especially the types of practices, you know, whether these four measurable practices of the heart or then the focused attention practice, like there's these kind of big buckets of types of practices. Um, and then these, you know, inquiry practices. Um, yeah, there's a, I think they all have a really unique um, benefit. And I think in, according to some um, traditions, there's like 10,000 practices, according to others, it's only 400, but there's a lot. Um, and I think finding the ones that we resonate to is great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Riff on that, that I only do Tong Wen when I show up and I'm being told that I'm doing Tong Wen. <laughs> <laughs> I work in mental health and specifically in substance use disorder. So I have this kind of like, thank you, I gave it the office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just have to say thank you because this was the most the easiest and the most accessible talk mm. has ever been and i found this incredible gift i did my brother as mm. well who i worry about incessantly mm. and all of a sudden i had this epiphany that if he's my brother he's gonna be okay because mm. this is not our first rodeo yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah thank you so much i'm so glad to hear that too and yeah, it was funny at one moment when we were all practicing, I was trying to imagine all the beings that were here, like all the people we were bringing in here with us, you know, it's like twice the room was here. Pretty amazing. Um, okay, so not a lot of time, but I I would really, I'd love to just share this, this sweet teaching um, of when the Buddha um hears that his his dad is um his dad is in his last days um and i think you know especially those of you who've come uh, for a while you, you might remember that the buddha really insists on walking everywhere both as a practice of slowing down and kind of being at the natural speed of um what you can cover in terms of um length and duration just with your own energy and with your own feet it's like such a beautiful imagine if we only went and did things we could walk to for like a week that'd be awesome um could be potentially uh but in this case and also connects him with the earth right no shoes the earth so a lot of the first times the buddha is meeting someone new there's like a washing of feet right so really that connection to the earth and in this case, uh, there is a carriage sent and he actually gets in a carriage. It's the only time I know of in, in the whole book where he makes haste. Okay. We are on um, 44. We're going to jump back to 43 next week for a nice little story, but uh, we're on 44. The king, now 82 years old, was thin and frail. The Buddha said, Father, please breathe gently and slowly. Smile. Nothing is more important than your breath at this moment. And then he mentions uh, Nanda, Ananda, Rahula, and Anuruddha, and I will all breathe together with you. So his sons, his grandson. um, The king looked at each one of them. He smiled and began to follow his breath. No one dared cry. After a moment, the king looked at the Buddha and said, I have seen clearly the impermanence of life and how if a person wants happiness, he should not lose himself in a life of desires. Happiness is obtained by living a life of simplicity and freedom. The queen Gotami told Buddha, these past months, the king has lived very simply. He's truly followed your teaching. Your teaching has transformed the lives of every one of us here. Still holding the king's hand, the Buddha said, Father, take a deep look at me, at Nanda and Rahula. Look at the green leaves on the branches outside your window. Life continues. As life continues, so do you. You will continue to live in me, Nanda and Rahula, and in all beings. 
The temporal body arises from the four elements, which dissolve only to endlessly recombine again. Father, don't think that because the body passes away, life and death can bind us. Rahula's body is also your body. The Buddha motioned to Rahula, this is um, his son, so the grandson. The Buddha motioned to Rahula to come and hold the king's other hand. A lovely smile arose on the face of the dying king. He understood the Buddha's words and he no longer feared death. So beautiful. Um, you know, there's just a couple elements in here. And um, it's interesting, of course, like death is the greatest um, transition and fearful thing we will ever face in life. But it carries a lot of similarity to other big fearful transitions that we can face. And this idea of like, being held in that. And being told, you know, just follow your breath, just follow your breath. And then the piece of, um, you know, recognizing just the continuity of all things and the temporal nature of all things. I can't imagine anything giving you more ease and comfort. You know, I think we imagine the end of, of life for ourselves or those we love. And what do we want them to feel? peace right love and it's it's really hard i um i uh, i had a near death experience uh, a couple of years back i didn't know i was allergic to fire ants long story short um and what was so amazing i mean it was truly one of the most amazing experiences of my life can't recommend it um it's not safe not safe <laughs> but one of the things that really struck me was like how unbelievably precious life felt when I woke up um, and realized I had almost died. And I had this sense, you know, for, for months afterwards of, oh man, I actually really don't want to die. Like I really, I'm really attached to living. Like I don't want to let go of everybody and everything. And it was a real like, okay. Like that's where you're at. You know, there's not a sense of um, recognizing the temporal body and the four elements and, you know, being able, able to like rest in that, you know, that's not how I felt. And, you know, I know being with my mom um, in the end, she was so afraid, you know, uh, not luckily, not luckily when she passed, there was a sense of peace, but that leading up to for many people, the months, if you have, if you're, you know, if you have a terminal illness, the months leading up to it can be a horrible time. But then you hear these other stories where people find it in the months leading up to their death. It's like the freest they've ever been. And usually those are people for whom there is a sense of what's described here. Like this like undulating flow of life and being a part of that and that um, sense of preciousness of this moment, just so beautiful. Some, some folks might know the name Roland Griffiths. There's a, he's an amazing uh, psychopharmacological researcher, very well known for his research in psilocybin at John Hopkins and um, looking at, you know, the mystical experience and, really interesting guy and was the last person you would expect to get in psychedelics, like khakis, you know, pocket protector, like glasses, you know, and he um, was so impressed by the research and, you know, became so interested in the mystical experience of a lot of his participants who actually were near end of life. And um, he was a Buddhist, is a Buddhist practitioner. He's still alive. Um, but the he deepened his, like, he was first interested in studying Buddhism. And when, when psychedelics came along, he's like, oh, it's kind of the same, like getting people to their place. And um, he has this interview with Tara Brock, um, who's a meditation teacher that I just, I couldn't recommend enough. It is so beautiful. And he is one of those beings who's like, I was just diagnosed. I have less than a year to live. I have never been so grateful and happy in my life. I know what it is to be free. And, you know, um, 
of course, I wish we could all feel that before we were facing death, but I think it gives us a little insight in why there's so many practices in Buddhism to prepare for dying. And we can treat so many, um, you know, there is certain practices where you imagine and feel as though every time you go to sleep, it's like entering into a, a stage or phase of death. And with that kind of preciousness and that kind of care and that kind of surrender and release, um, we, we don't all get to have the Buddha with us holding our hand. So, you know, we got to kind of practice this for ourselves. And, you know, I do think Tonglen is one of those practices that will really help us um, as we face death, as we help others face death. Um, there's a little bit more here. Uh, would, you mind, would you mind repeating the name of the person? What's his name? Oh, Roland Griffiths. Okay. Roland Griffiths with uh, Tara Brock. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah. Why do you think that this part will help? Yeah. I mean, I think with death, which is obviously inevitable um we spend a lot of time avoiding its reality and meeting it like on its own ground like i'm i'm, I'm going to die um and to have the tool we could have tonglen for you know our own feelings and fears of death and when you know there's just there's like volumes of teaching on this final stages of death called the bardos and in these final stages, there's um, a lot of practices that one person can do and that those around them can do for them. And um, a lot of the gestalt of those practices is surrendering and opening and, and having exactly as the Buddha described, being able to at least hold open the possibility that there's more than just this body. Because what happens a lot for people towards the end um, is grasping so like that tightness that we started with so what is it like to practice the release feel the grasping i don't want to die i don't want to leave everyone no release you know just that oh, there's so many practices i think that point to that same um exercise yeah thank you for that question and i think um some of you may be familiar with uh, a year to live by Stephen Levine. It's an online course that Mary Stancavage uh, teaches with Vinnie Ferraro too. It's so awesome. But the, the book itself, um, Stephen Levine, he like shepherded thousands of people to their death and wrote a book for everyone to do a thought experiment as though they had a year to live. And it goes through a variety of practices. I, uh, I read it every year, right before the new year. Um, I actually have an audio book of it. It's only two hours and it's him reading it. And he sounds kind of like, a, um, I don't know the, the right description. Very cool, like loungy voice. Um, and it's, but it is, it's this invitation to, you know, recall and surrender and recall and surrender and forgive and surrender. And this very next passage here, um, the king's advisors and ministers were all present and he motioned them to approach. And in a feeble voice, he said, during my reign, I have doubtlessly upset and wronged you before I die. I ask your forgiveness, you know, and, um, and the advisors and ministers couldn't hold back their tears. And they said, you have been the most virtuous, blah, blah, blah. No one has any reason to fault you. Um, eh, I doubt that, but um, <laughs> that's nice, you know, but like that idea of like really trying to, um, yeah, like have that freedom of your own heart too um, towards the end. And it's interesting in that book, there's some practices um, around what do you do if someone who you want to forgive is no longer around or is not interested in forgiving you. And you can do similar practices like Tong Glenn, right? And you can offer this person compassion, you can ask for forgiveness, but all doing it just with yourself, which I think is, yeah, it's really lovely. Um, yeah, I think the, the, there's many books on, on end of life with, uh, especially with the Tibetan Buddhist practices, the Tibetan book of living and dying. It's, I highly recommend 
Um, the teacher, unfortunately, is a quite unethical person, so I haven't wanted to teach it here, but I have wanted to teach it here. So we'll leave that open um, for a little while because it's it's really powerful and such a great thing to to practice. I know it sounds so morbid, but really is such a great thing to practice and prepare for dying. It really can help us get that what we'll call the Roland Griffiths effect, you know, that ecstatic joy of living when we kind of let in that reality and possibility of our own death. Um, so then there's a little bit about the king, you know, trying to figure out who his heir will be. It's not the Buddha. And they figure it out of who's going to run the kingdom. And he says, um, now I can close my eyes in peace. I'm happy to have seen the Buddha before I left this world. My heart is now without any cares whatsoever. I have no regrets or bitterness. I hope the Buddha will rest for a while here. Um, da, 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 and assure our, our country moves towards peace. The king's voice faded to barely a whisper. The Buddha said, I will remain here for whatever time is needed. The king smiled weakly, but his eyes radiated peace. He closed his eyes and passed from this life. Queen Gotami and Yasodhara began to cry and the minister sobbed in grief. The Buddha folded the king's hand on his chest and then motioned for everyone to stop crying. He told them to follow their breathing. And after several moments, he suggested they meet in the outer chamber to discuss arrangements for the funeral. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, you know, in certain in certain um, belief systems, crying around a person who's dying, it like tethers them to their body when they're ready to go. Right. So the suggestion is to not that you shouldn't be sad, but to let them go peacefully. Um, and uh, Buddha arranges part of the funeral and he says at the funeral, birth, old age, sickness and death occur in the life of all persons. We should reflect on birth, old age, sickness and death every day in order to prevent ourselves from being become lost from being becoming lost in desires, and in order to be able to create a life filled with peace, joy, and contentment. A person who has attained the way looks on birth, old age, sickness, and death with equanimity. The true nature of all dharmas is that there is neither birth nor death, neither production or destruction, neither increasing uh, nor decreasing. So this idea that, you know, if we're fixated on you know, just what happens to our body suffering in this lifetime. That's the, that's actually where sickness, old age and death happen. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, uh, that's that sweet passage. It's only a couple pages, but I, I just found it so, so moving and needless to say, if, if we haven't yet, all of us face loss and to, give ourselves some time to, to work with that directly feels, feels very meaningful. So thank you all. Let's take a moment and dedicate our practice tonight. Hmm. So connecting to our own sense of our heart and our body in this moment and considering if there is a sense of energy or insight or tenderness that has been generated. And really offering everything or anything that has been generated this night for the purposes of furthering the possibility that all beings could know deep compassion, that all beings could be healthy and strong, that all beings would know safety and belonging, that all beings would be free. Thank you all. I um, I want to plug one thing that's happening this weekend. Oh, 
My goodness. Okay. So Saturday, we've got uh, in person, Venerable Tenzin Chioki, who's coming to us from Santa Cruz. She's, um, man, so cool. I mean, unbelievably cool. I'm just going to give a tiny biography. She spent 30 years as a Tibetan Buddhist nun did a lot of work in death and dying. Um, she is currently um, a guiding teacher at IMS um, in Santa Cruz, Insight. Santa Cruz, yes, Tibetan Buddhist, yes, in Insight. It's totally strange and wonderful. Um, she'll be teaching on compassion. She's been teaching on compassion uh, from the point of view of traditional Tibetan Buddhism, but also from the Stanford program, the Cultivation of Compassion Training. She is dedicated herself and her life to one of social justice and is hilarious. Like really calm. Yeah, she's amazing. Really worth it. Yeah, yeah, highly, highly recommended. Um, and then Sunday, just this unbelievably unique, bright, also a former monastic, Ashley, um, Tibetan Buddhist who, um, uh, is living currently in London, is um, originally from Russia and, and spent many years in Nepal as a monk studying uh, with Chokinima. And yeah, listening to him is like, a, it's like the mind gets slightly uh, effervescent and illuminated. I don't know how to better describe it. Super scholarly, um, super interesting. And that'll be online. Online only. Yeah, because he's in London. Um, and then... What else? Oh, I'm going to do a half day here in June. I can't remember if it's Saturday or Sunday, the 8th or 9th. The 10th, I think one of those days, Saturday. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be from 10 to 1. And we're going to do a mini, like, kind of dipping our feet into cultivating emotional balance. So anger and compassion. Um, sadness and uh empathetic joy so working with the four virtues of the heart and then i'll do a part two with fear and joy later on so yeah that'll be that and um we are um always appreciative and desirous of your support to keep this center going to keep the space open our friends online and here please offer what you can by literally any means cash venmo um, also, we really need volunteers to help us have more classes here. There's some really amazing new classes. A new class starts on June 8th with Cyrus Smith and I can't remember the other person's name and rainy um and yeah like so we love having new events coming here but we also need folks to help it's entirely volunteer run center so there we go mace love it um for all of it Thursday. Thursday night. Could you repeat it? Yeah, I got it all. Cool. Uh, could you repeat that? We didn't pick up on that. May said we need more volunteers. And since especially for and also for Wednesday night, and since you're already here, like volunteer. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>